Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome today to today's webcast on wind, market update and outlook for the global offshore wind market. Um, this webinar is part of a series of webinars in the run-up to the launch of our Global Wind Report, which will be released next week on the 25th of March. Uh, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping rules before we get started today. If you've joined uh, on your desktop, you'll see a GoToWebinar panel. If at any time you have questions during the webcast, please submit your questions on the questions tab on the GoToWebinar panel, and we'll pick them up in the Q&A session. Um, if at any time your uh, audio goes out, please just close and, and restart the webinar. Um, and if you uh, are joining on the phone today, um, you can do the same thing, just hang up and then restart the webinar. Um, uh, the webinar will be recorded and you'll be sent a recording after uh, the webinar is finished. If you like today's presentation, please just get in touch. Um, I'll now introduce our first speaker to, the, to today's webinar, our um, GWEX Strategy Director, Fang Zhao, who will provide an overview of the global offshore wind market in 2019. Over to you, Fang. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon uh, in Asia Pacific. Um, I will be the first speaker um, um, giving the overview about what's going on in global offshore wind market in 2019. And the, the first slide here we can see uh, in 2019, uh, we got a really good year. Um, Globally, we have more than six gigawatt new offshore wind turbine installed, uh, bringing the global offshore wind total to about 29 gigawatt. Uh, out of this uh, six gigawatt, um, China installed more than 2.3 gigawatt, and uh, in a single year, uh, making the largest uh, offshore market in new installation. And the second a largest market that's the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, the country made also a record installation, um, more than 1.7 gigawatt in one year, um, but it's only ranked as number two. Number three market is it's Germany. Um, Germany installed 1.1 gigawatt offshore last year, um, make it the third largest market um, globally. So we also have information um, apart from the three countries I just mentioned: China, United Kingdom, Germany. Uh, number four, actually, it's Denmark. That's where I'm best. Uh, number five, it's Belgium. Uh, the two countries has a similar installation from uh, where you can see. Uh, the next market that's uh, Taiwan in Asia Pacific. Um, Taiwanese market um, had 120 megawatt. Uh, installed uh, last year. Uh, in Portugal, we have one turbine floating. That's the 8.3 MHA Vista uh, offshore turbine installed. It's a, a three turbine project. Um, by the end of 2019, we only have one installed and grid connected. Uh, the last market um, where we have the turbine installation, that's Japan. In Japan, we have one floating turbine installed. It's a two blade, just to be clear, um, based on the floating foundation, that's a three megawatt. So in total, this bring um, 6.1 gigawatt. Uh, looking at the distribution of the um, global installation, uh, the first pie chart indicate um, Nearly 60% of the new installation is located in Europe. Uh, in Asia Pacific, we have 41% uh, um, marked this year. Um, looking at the situation uh, per country, uh, the second pie chart indicates um, China is the number one uh, with nearly 40% of global market share in new installation, followed by the UK, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, Taiwan, Turkey, and Japan. 
And in terms of the specific numbers, um, we have the box here on the slide where you can see the, the exact installation. Uh, we have a, a note, footnote um, for the eight market where we have the in, new installation. Um, the load is about China. Right now we have 2395 megawatt installed uh, in China. This is a preliminary numbers. We, we tried, um, actually we, we should have the webcast uh, a week ago, but due to the coronavirus, it's really hard um, for the Chinese turbine OEM utility um, to get the turbine installation data confirmed. So today we pre present the data 2395 megawatt as the preliminary data. Um, hopefully, um, in our final report to be released, as Alicia mentioned, on 25th of March, we will have the final figure for China. But the, um, I'm pretty sure that the numbers will close to we present here today, um, 2.3 um, gigawatt. So next slide, please. So um, we have, uh, you know, the majority new offshore turbine installed last year, mainly in Europe and China, Taiwan, a few turbine uh, in um, Portugal and uh, uh, Japan. But uh, it's, it, does, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing happened uh, in the rest of the world where we don't have the new report. Actually, uh, in the US, uh, we see great progress has been made uh, in, a, uh, in 2019. Uh, we see a couple of states, including New York, New Jersey, the increase actually upgrade their offshore target. Um, according to our own statistics um, for United States, uh, in total, uh, the country has offshore wind procurement target um, reached to 25.4 gigawatt uh, by the end of last year. Uh, but a year ago in 2018, the number is only 9.1. So you can see uh, in terms of the uh, government or state level ambitions, this is uh, a tremendous um, opportunity over there. Uh, on the state level, um, the numbers indicate uh, six states has already selected more than six gigawatt offshore wind through the state's issued uh, solicitation um, last year and uh, more uh, project will be launched or auctioned uh, on the state level uh, specifically in new york and new jersey uh, in 2020. Um, right now looking at our gy global offshore project database uh, we have uh, 15 offshore project, which is in different stage of development, but based on the uh, announcement by project developer, there are about 10 gigawatt uh, offshore project, uh, offshore wind capacity, uh, likely to be built uh, or in operation by 2026. So you can see that's a a lot of uh, capacity over there in the US. Um, on the right side, uh, where I already mentioned that uh, Taiwan, even though just the install 120 uh, megawatt, that's the Formosa uh, one phase two project uh, with Oster, um as the developer uh, and with the SGRE turbine. Um, but actually there are more projects under construction right now. We get a lot of uh, progress made in terms of project financing, uh, order confirmation. So by 2024, if the country uh, can follow the exactly timeline, um, there will be 5.5 new capacity to be built uh, in the next five years. Uh, on top of that, another 10 gigawatt actually is planned to be built uh, in the island um, between 2026 and 2035, which means uh, there will be a stable growth, uh, about one gigawatt um, growth 
on an annual basis uh, after 2025, this will absolutely bring the visibility and make sure that the industrialization could be reached and bring new jobs and etc. cetera. Um, the next market is Japan. On the, on the, on my first slide, where we, we mentioned only one floating turbine installed in 2019. Um, but uh, on the policy side, uh, actually, uh, all positive steps has been made in 2019. Um, Japanese has accelerated the offshore development uh, policy-wise, and a lot of uh, practice has been done in terms of the uh, selection of the location, port area, etc. And luckily, uh, we will see the first offshore wind auctions will be launched uh, summertime uh, this year um, to facilitate the offshore wind growth uh, in Japan. Um, maybe some of you have already seen the, the, the press release um, by GWAC. Um, we have launched the Japan Offshore Task Force uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, also in October this year, we're going to host uh, the first Global Offshore One Summit, Japan edition, um, together with uh, the local um, ministry and also GWPA, the local association. Um, our global chair for Offshore Task Force, Alastair, who will present today as well, is the co-lead for this task force. You can bring in more information later. Uh, moving on from Japan to Vietnam, uh, we, we also uh, observe a lot of progress. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, slightly different uh, from Europe, but similar to what we had uh, in China, uh, they have several intertidal projects going on. Um, we saw quite a lot of uh, order. Um, a lot of the before the uh, before the Christmas last year, um, orders uh, are launched by SGRE, several orders for intertidal project by, by Vistas as well. So looking at our project pipeline, also uh, the input from our local association and the developer plus turbine OEM, uh, we believe that around one gigawatt um, of your one plus uh, intertidal, many intertidal projects will be built in the next five years uh, in Vietnam. So again, uh, progress has been made um, in terms of the new installation and also in terms of project preparation. Um, so the the bar chart in the middle just give you an idea about how quickly um, the new installation globally uh, wise um, has been done. You can see in 2015, the annual installation is just 3.4 gigawatt, but in 2019, we have 6.1, almost double. Uh, so this is absolutely a good news in terms of, you know, the uh, penetration for offshore wind. We have more contribution from, uh, from offshore wind and so in terms of the penetration rate or the market share for new offshore wind installation in the global uh, picture, so last year 6.1 gigawatt, which means that 10% of the uh, new installation globally uh, is from offshore wind. Uh, that's absolutely, uh, you know, this double digital, that's uh, what we, we, we experienced uh, for the very first time. That's uh, uh, absolutely uh, exciting news. So um, looking at the future, and we have one slide, please. Um, we can see, um, even though, you know, uh, we, we have already got record installation in 2019, more than six gigawatt installed, but looking at the future, uh, in the next five years, uh, we will, we're not going to see a flat uh, growth of the market. Actually, we will see um, quite a lot of new installation to be built in the next five years. Uh, according to our GY market intelligence database, 
um, plus the input from local uh, partner and the turbine OEM developer. We believe that uh, about minimum 50 gigawatt new offshore wind will be built in the next five years between 2020 and 2024. So this, uh, if we follow this curve, um, the new installation um, in 2024, that's around 15 gigawatt, which means the market share uh, of offshore wind in global new installation will grow from today's 10% to 20%. So the market share will be doubled. So that's uh, that's absolutely uh, encouraging to see. So we have the cargo for the next five years. Uh, so 19 um, percent actually is uh, slightly higher uh, than what we had another uh, five years uh, ago. For looking back, uh, looking at the distribution of the new installation globally, uh, we believe that uh, Asia Pacific will continue to grow. Um, Europe will have uh, stable growth. Um, the market uh, on, the, on the country level in Europe, the UK will remain as the largest market uh, in new addition, um, followed by the Netherlands, France, Germany, Belgium, and Denmark. And so as you can see, Germany used to be the second largest market in Europe. Um, but looking at the project pipeline, they are not going to have the big project to be built before uh, the developers start put the project out of the first auction, the second auction online. That's 2024. So therefore, we will we will see uh, the Netherlands will replace Germany as the second largest market in Europe in new installation in the next five years. In Asia, no doubt about China will continue to take the lead at the largest market, uh, followed by Taiwan. Japan, Vietnam, and also South Korea. We will see a couple of uh, demonstration projects uh, each um, 100 megawatt level to be built uh, in the next couple of years. But the utility scale large project um, cannot be built uh, until 2024. Uh, in the US, uh, the first utility scale offshore project, um, when we see the standard European utility one, uh, right now, it's larger than 800 megawatt. So we will have such a project to be online, power 2023. That will be the year the U.S. market became becoming a truly global market. So that's the the uh, the growth um, outlook um, based on our internal data. So in in general, um, the potential is there. It's no longer a European driven market. So already we have APAC um, in tremendous growth in parallel with what we, we have here in Europe. And soon start from 2023, we will see volume to be built um, from North America. Um, regarding the statics, statistics uh, from the supply side, uh, I will just give you some high level numbers um, because the data we are still working on uh, the detailed uh, numbers will be disclosed uh, in another GWAC report to be released uh, in the beginning of April. That's what we call global supply side data, where we will have the detailed numbers for turbine OEM and ranking in terms of installation per country or per region, and also in terms of drive train. Um, but looking at the, the statistic in 2019 in Europe, we see three players dominate the market. Uh, SGRE has more than 60% of market share in new installation, followed by MHR Vistas. Uh, another two company uh, has smaller size of the project installation, that's uh, uh, GE Renewable uh, and also Semvain. Um, so looking at the drivetrain, um, one third of the project installed last year, that's the gear drive. Um, the majority is medium speed from MHA Vistas. And we have some high speed um, gearbox from Semvain. The rest of the market in general, that's about 70%, uh, uh, another two thirds, that's uh, for a direct drive. In terms of the average turbine size, 
in 2018, we already see uh, the European market reach the milestone of seven megawatt per turbine. Uh, in 2019, we continue to see the growth of the Arctic turbine size. Last year, 7.2 uh, megawatt uh, per model. The situation is slightly different. My colleague Wan Liang, um, who will be the next speaker, can bring us to the up speed. Um, so now I'm going to hand over. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fang, for that really interesting presentation. And indeed, super encouraging to see how the offshore wind market has grown immensely in such a short period of time. As you mentioned, China will continue to be a leader in terms of um, adding new capacity for offshore wind um, in the, this 2019 and also in the immediate future. So I'll turn it over now to Wang Yang, who is the China director, who can provide a bit more insight on um, what's next for, for China's offshore wind market. Over to you, Wang Yang. Thank you, uh, Alisa. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Wang Liang from China. Uh, Beijing. Um, as Feng just mentioned uh, in his part that China has been the biggest uh, single market in 2019. Uh, but we believe that uh, China will probably hold this position uh, onwards. Um, a short history of China's offshore market. Basically, the the first uh, uh, offshore farm, wind farm was uh, uh, was established uh, ten years ago in Ch in Shanghai, but uh, later on, then the, the the development was quite slow. I think because uh, people believe that uh, the offshore uh, wind is too expensive, and also the technology wise is quite challenging, and there are also many uh, there were also many uh, regulations that the developer need to face which was quite complicated. Uh, but since to, uh, uh, 2016, as things, the situation was changed a little bit, uh, that some uh, coastal uh, provinces, they, uh, they basically increased their interest in offshore uh, wind uh, because the, the price of uh, offshore wind is getting more competitive. And also, uh, the coastal provinces in China, like uh, Jiangsu, uh, Guangdong, they are kind of developed area. So they, they have strong needs of uh, power. And uh, uh, from the offshore uh, wind farm, it's short distance to uh, to the consuming center, you know, the big cities, rather than the, the onshore wind farm uh, uh, in the remote. Uh, area in China. So in the past three to four years that the the, uh, the provinces like Jiangsu, Guangdong, Fujian, and Zhejiang, they have approved a long list of uh, uh, offshore wind, wind farms. So we, we will have a look at the pipeline later on. Uh, and if you look at the uh, installation that things 2016 to last year, basically the uh, annual increase re reached was more than uh, 50 percent. So from uh, only 590 megawatts uh, uh, newly installed in uh, 2016 to uh, more than 2.3 gigawatts uh, last year, um, and the uh, important turbine uh, suppliers are. Uh, here we mentioned a few names like ICE Wind, which is Shanghai Electric Wind Power, uh, which has a, a cooperation before uh, with uh, kind of joint venture before with uh, Siemens Wind Power, and now they also have they still have the license of Siemens uh, offshore turbines, and we also have uh, Mingyang Goldwind Envision, and Dongfang, and CSIC Haizhuang. Um, if, if we look at the installation of 2019, uh, basically I see wind uh, take up around one third of the market. And uh, uh, Mingyang and the Goldwind, they, both of them, they have uh, more, uh, about 20 to 25% of the market. And uh, Invision has uh, 
approach to 20%. And, uh, but a lot of names like Dongfang and the CSIC, they, don't, they, they didn't have installation last year, but uh, they, they have some orders, big orders uh, uh, in pipeline. Uh, and uh, the, in, for, for the coming years, that we believe uh, China will have uh, our, uh, more, even more uh, installation because uh, there is an installation, there will be an installation rush, uh, both onshore and offshore. So we can uh, come to the next uh, slide. Uh, then we will have a look at the policy, uh, which was uh, during the uh, installation rush. Uh, in uh, May uh, last year, uh, the central government of China, uh, NDRC, is uh, that's uh, the department to make our planning uh, of uh, energy. Uh, that's uh, for offshore development that uh, 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 basically uh, you can, uh, the, for offshore uh, wind, wind projects that if, if you can uh, get connected to the grid before the end of 2021, that you can enjoy the uh, fitting, fixed fitting, uh, fixed the price. Uh, uh, price. Uh, yes, now we have this page. Yes. So basically, for offshore projects, uh, if you have been approved before the end of 2018, that's and you got uh, connected to the grid before the end of 2021, then you can enjoy uh, the the price. A fixed price of uh, 0.85 uh, RMB uh, per kilowatt hour. Uh, as I mentioned, that those uh, uh, coastal provinces they have uh, uh, approved uh, many projects. Uh, in total, uh, the amount is more than uh, 40 gigawatt. Uh, uh, and uh, at this moment. Uh, there are about there are at least 10 gigawatts is under con uh, construction. Uh, so that's why we believe for next year and the year after uh, the the Chinese uh, the China offshore market will be very busy. Uh, and uh, uh, after 2021, uh, uh, that's uh, the government just, uh, sorry, uh, Alisa, we can move to the next uh, slide. You have a, uh, have a look at the uh, shares of this uh, approved offshore project. Yeah, we can see that uh, we, we have, uh, here we can, have uh, some names of uh, the key players, you know, the de developers of uh, uh, this more than 40 gigawatts offshore projects. Yes, Alicia, next uh, slide. The leading provinces here are uh, Guangdong province and uh, Jiangsu. Uh, Guangdong has been uh, very aggressive in offshore development. So they have about more, uh, around half of the uh, uh, pipeline is uh, 23 gigawatts. Then it's uh, Jiangsu, which is uh, 8.5 gigawatts. Then followed with by uh, Fujian province and Zhejiang province. And we also have uh, uh, Shandong and the Liaoning. Uh, and if we look at the key developers, uh, the, there are, uh, most of them are uh, state-owned uh, uh, power companies, power development company, companies. The first one is the China 
three gauges. We call it a CPG. Uh, they have 10 gigawatts in hand, pipeline in hand. Then we have China General Nuclear. Uh, previously, it's called China Guangdong Nuclear. Uh, it's, they also have around 10 gigawatts pipeline. And then uh, we have a state's power investment. Uh, uh, it's, in short, it's called SDIC. It's also very active with uh, 5.9 uh, gigawatts in hand. And then we have Huaneng Group and also China Energy. Uh, people know Long Yuan uh, was uh, uh, the first mover in China's offshore market. And Long Yuan is part of China Energy. Uh, so China Energy also has 2.5 gigawatts in hand. And then we have uh, Yue Dian, which is uh, uh, also you can uh, consider it as Guangdong Energy because Guangdong is very active and the Yue Dian is the local uh, uh, developer in Guangdong province. They also have more than 2.2 uh, gigawatts in hand. Um, so for so if, uh, uh, as, as we mentioned that there'll be an in installation rush that, uh, for example, Guangdong, uh, they would like to have eight gigawatts uh, installed in the uh, next two years. And uh, by the end of this year, Jiangsu will have uh, about 10 gigawatts under construction. But people will have the uh, question uh, whether they can uh, really, uh, you know, finished or be delivered in time. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's the challenge that uh, the, these uh, developers are, you know, are facing. Uh, like uh, the, so how about the supply chain, especially the, uh, for some large component, and how about the installation vessels uh, and, uh, and the team. Uh, so, uh, in reality, we believe uh, the installation for the next two next two years will be around uh, three point five gigawatts to four gigawatts uh, in China. Uh, and after the year two thousand twenty one, there might be a, a short uh, slowdown uh, because the subsidy from central government will be removed. Uh, but people still uh, expect that the local government will continue, you know, to provide some subsidies uh, to uh, to the projects uh, because uh, doing offshore business is not just about to have the the power, but also you you are building our cluster in your province. So people, you know, believe that uh, the province like Guangdong or uh, Jiangsu or Fujian and also Zhejiang, they, they do have this uh, strong interest that to, to encourage offshore business and to keep them in their uh, province because they, that can uh, create uh, GDP and also uh, jobs uh, for their provinces. So hopefully after uh, the year 2021, uh, the uh, offshore projects can still enjoy some subsidy from local government. Uh, Alisa, please, uh, next uh, slide. And uh, to uh, and on the other side, that to control this uh, uh, insulation rush, you know, in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, the China's National Energy Administration just released a notice uh, to limit offshore projects approving. Uh, basically, if you have, you know, as a province, if you have reached your uh, target, uh, you know, for the 13th five year plan, that you are not allowed to approve a uh, new uh, offshore project. So basically, we, we believe uh, this uh, pipeline of for 40. 44 gigawatts uh, we will not be will not growing you know let very much uh, uh, in 
2020 because um, basically all the coastal provinces has reached their targets or already. So uh, and uh, and next year will be the first year of China's 14th five year plan. So there might be some new targets uh, for the country and uh, for each province for offshore. And then uh, maybe there will be uh, this, they will remove this uh, limitation uh, from next year. But this year, that's uh, the focus will be uh, the construction uh, instead of uh, uh, approving uh, new projects. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one, one, one more point, uh, uh, Feng just mentioned that in Europe, the average uh, turbine, offshore turbine size is about seven uh, megawatts. In China, uh, in the year, uh, in last year, it's uh, uh, still uh, four megawatts. So it's uh, uh, lower uh, than the uh, uh, European market. But if you look at the pipeline uh, or projects uh, and their construction, uh, uh, basically it's uh, growing uh, quite fast, uh, at least to 5.5 or six to and, and seven megawatt. And the, the uh, key turbine manufacturers, they already uh, developed their uh, the uh, eight to ten gigaw uh, megawatt uh, turbines already uh, for for uh, for the first uh, batch. Yeah, uh, but that's uh, basically that's uh, the end of uh, uh, my presentation. That uh, China it's uh, moving fast, but they still need to invest more in uh, technology innovation and also how to make the uh, process management more uh, smooth and uh, to uh, have our uh, to 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 have a faster development and and, and also make our better uh, supply chain for offshore development yeah thank you very much thank you very much Wang Miang. Uh, now we'll shift focus um, and look at what markets are emerging for the offshore wind industry and what GWEC is doing to facilitate growth um, in these markets. So I'll pass it off to Alistair Dutton, who is chair of GWEC's Global Offshore Wind Task Force. Over to you, Alistair. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, so let's start with the big picture. This is the Global Wind Atlas. Um, which is available free online and <clears throat> this is version 3 which now looks out to 200 kilometers from shore. The things you can quickly see is that areas which are orange and red are suitable for offshore wind um, and that the offshore wind is so much stronger than onshore wind and you may well know that power is related to the cube of the wind speed so the capacity factors you see for offshore wind are by far the largest that you will see in the wind industry. And the International Ag Energy Agency has now used the phrase that offshore wind is variable baseload. It's so reliable. You can also start to see um, that regions are particularly attractive. Obviously Europe, yes, both coasts of the US, but Asia is, um, as Fong mentioned, of particular interest. The Atlas is funded by the World Bank, uh, a unit called ESMAP. And if we could have the next slide. Last year, World Bank and um, International Finance Corporation uh, started a program to take offshore wind to developing countries. Um, their first report, which I was the key author for, um, has this summary table in it. Again, this is freely available online. And when we're talking about just the technical potential, um, there's a total there of 3.1 terawatts for just eight countries that are listed. The, um, be careful, technical potential is one thing, but only a small percentage of this is likely to actually be deployed by the time it's gone through consenting, economics, and all those things. Next slide, please. In the report, we look at each of the eight countries, and this just happens to be the one for Vietnam. And 
uh, it shows on the map the striped areas are suitable for fixed foundations up to 50 meters water depth um, and the dotted areas would be suitable for floating foundations up to a thousand meters water depth and um, what we see in these countries um, the, the growth in power demand is massive and they need new plant at the moment a lot of that would be coal and we're very much focused on trying to move that to offshore wind for all the good reasons there are studies underway and world banks doing one of those to help the government understand how they could deploy this market and the key timetable is this power development plan number eight which is due out in a draft form in june of this year and um, final form is expected to be early next year. Uh, what I heard yesterday was actually January. And next slide, please. Uh, of the other countries in the report, you can see um, various stages of, of progress. I won't dwell on this other than to say that GWEC and World Bank are working on this together with GWEC particularly being good at organising events um, and World Bank really likes working with us. Next slide, please. Throughout the engagement with these countries, most of which I've visited in the last six months, um, we're using a, this framework, which is a structured um, way of talking through the 12 elements that you would seek to have in a market and I won't go through the detail just now other than it's working extremely well um, and we just deploy it in subtly different ways depending on how mature or not those markets are. Next slide please Alyssa. And the big topic is of course floating wind. Um, some of the countries floating is by far the most uh, interesting topic and there is an, a lot of debate as to when floating will come to scale in the market but we are particularly keen to help it the the resource itself means that you treble the size or more than treble the size of the market and you can see the graph on the bottom right hand side ecuador who are one of the leaders in the topic are um, thinking that there will be 13 gigawatts uh, available by 2030. It's more not the number, it's more when the commercial scale projects start to kick in. And one of the areas of particular interest is Scotland uh, and the Scotwind tender that is um, about to be launched because the government in the UK is now a conservative majority and in their manifesto, not only are they saying 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, but this phrase, we will enable new floating wind. What that means is they now have a consultation out at the moment as to how they can support specifically floating wind. And this could be the uh, initiator for the commercial scale projects. Next slide, please. A lot of people talk about how the price of uh, offshore wind has come down so far, and that is a absolutely key element. But there are so many other benefits available, um, and this is where governments get particularly interested. Um, jobs is by far the biggest of the topics, but all the those other topics on this slide have uh, they play into government plans around the world. And we haven't even listed on this one, but of course, the hydrogen economy and um, the amazing wind resources in places where there isn't power demand could become a, a key. Well, we think it will be a key factor towards the back end of this decade. Next slide. So I started on, um, so I have uh, over seven years running the offshore wind program in the UK, but in the last three years, I've been focusing on taking offshore wind global. And this is my perspective on the market. So the maturing markets, I still don't consider any market fully mature. 
um, are on the bottom of this graphic. So we've already heard these are places where offshore wind is being deployed and a lot more will the, be deployed in this decade. But we're seeing an, uh, a new breed of um, locations where policy is in place and uh, to differing amounts, but we will see a considerable build out um, this decade. And then there's a whole group that we're in conversation with now. And there are names there that some people have, have not mentioned yet in the sector. And in fact, I can think of another five in the last week that have um, expressed an interest and we will be working with. Last slide, please. So what numbers does uh, GWEC have? You can see a considerable build out. This is specifically just for new markets. So it does include the US and um, some other markets that you'll have heard of, but it also includes a number that are still to come. Consistent build um, and totaling 80 gigawatts just in these markets. So this decade is going to be really exciting for the offshore wind sector, particularly as floating wind realizes its potential. And beyond 2030, it's going to really get <laughs> not just exciting, but super exciting. Um, so for developers and the supply chain, it's now about where to be and when. And GWEC, fortunately, can help you answer that question and uh, help accelerate the adoption of offshore wind. Thank you very much, Alyssa. So we're now moving to a question and answer session. Yes, so we're now moving to the, the Q&A um, session. Um, we have quite a few questions and only about 10 minutes to answer them. So I'm going to try to group a few questions together. Um, uh, Alistair, while I still have you on the line, I have a few questions about uh, a couple emerging markets that you mentioned, if you could just go into a bit more detail about these specific markets. So we have questions about what's next for offshore in India, um, as well as the Pacific region, so Australia and, and New Zealand. Okay, good questions. So India is a very uh, interesting market. Uh, you'll know that uh, the Indian government came out for an expression of interest in 2018 for a one gigawatt um, opportunity uh, of Gujarat in the northwest of India. There's, the market has not heard very much since. Um, we visited the Indian government and some of it was a private conversation, but the bits that I can say is that uh, the government and particularly um, their, um, I'll call it their research body, have been doing a lot more studies in the Gujarat area, whether that's um, geophysical, wind speeds, all sorts of um, data collection. So that's progressing. And also the politics has changed slightly. So now there's a, a renewed interest in the Tamil Nadu area, right to the south of India. And um, that's, you, you may have seen a recent announcement that, that's now talking about that, which wasn't the case two years ago. And World Bank is working, and GWEC is working with the government to see how that could be brought through. Um, the hard bit is that offshore wind is more expensive currently than onshore wind and PV, and the government is trying to work out how to provide support. Our view is that um, the most logical way forward is to do a demonstration scale project something between 50 and 300 megawatts to prove, not the technology, but to prove the process of building an offshore wind farm. So that's in dialogue at the moment. Um, then we go to Australia. We have um, one major project, the Star of the South, two gigawatts, which is in development. We see the 
uh, government starting to put um, the structure in place, and in particular, an organization called NOPSIMA, um, which is the oil and gas regulator offshore, has been given the responsibility of regulating offshore wind. They've put in place the simple um, uh, rights to develop the site, but it will be the states, which, so in this case, Victoria, which will be procuring the power, and they are very keen on offshore wind. So there's an awful lot to be sorted out in Australia. Um, and so far, we've seen very little activity in New Zealand, although that would need to be much more of the floating market. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, next question is, we've, we've actually received quite a few on this, um, and it's a bit of a hot topic at the moment, um, is how the current uh, coronavirus crisis will affect um, the growth of the offshore wind industry, um, especially since um, the, the outbreak started in China, which is the now the biggest installer of new offshore wind capacity. Um, for this question, I'm going to pass it on to um, Fang um, to, to take this one up. Fang? Thank you, Alicia. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, you know, at GYC, we did one update in terms of the impact of coronavirus together with the local association, Sevilla, um, in the middle of February, the we, we did the more than 25 survey and interview directly with the, the Chinese turbine OEM key component manufacturer, a domestic and international company who had set up in China, also a developer. So the result uh, is clear. By the time we were we were working on the survey, uh, there is a big question mark about when the Chinese government can get the virus under control. Um, by that time, we expect two to three months delay. Uh, however, uh, we do have a scenario in the end. We say if the Chinese government can get the virus under control, um, at least out of uh, Wuhan or Hubei province, um, in the middle of March, we will see probably just a one to three months, uh, one to two months uh, impact or delay of project uh, deployment. Uh, under that analysis, it's clear. Uh, the majority, uh, the major impact is not uh, offshore. Uh, clearly, it's onshore. Onshore because China is too big. Um, the major impact, that's the center of China, where we have the low speed wind installed, mainly due to the, the challenge of logistic and also the labor, uh, the labor force uh, who will who need to go to the purchase line to get the purchase built. Um, but looking at the offshore sector specifically, um, in fact, by the time in the middle of the February, uh, when we were working on our update in terms of the impact, we already see the governor, for example, the governor of Guangdong province, Wanang, made it clear. Guangdong, that's the largest province in China in terms of the project under construction or in the pipeline. Uh, looking at their target, they have 30 gigawatt by 2030, the same size like the UK market, just in one single province. The governor, uh, Mr. Ma, uh, went out uh, visit one of the project uh, in Guangdong, where Minyang is the key supplier. So you can see uh, during the crisis, uh, even before the Chinese government gets the virus under control, the offshore province already start uh, you know, running in full steam, mainly due to there is a big deadline over there. That's a 2021 that's mentioned in one of the slides a while now. So project work um, absolutely uh, in full, running in full speed in Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, they are the uh, major province where we have the project. Uh, we had a con conversation with uh, the developer and also turbine OEMs. They see less impact uh, of, the in uh, of the wires, uh, mainly because you know, off your one project construction is more like more isolate. You know, you need the vessels and go to the project work. It's far away from the population, so that's that's uh, that's why you know the impact is relatively small, and also major component they cannot be shipped through the main road. They have to go with the vessels. So that's another way to get rid of this challenging situation. So in general, 
uh, we don't see any, uh, you know, they were more or less a bit impact, but in terms of our load outlook for offshore in China, we still believe that uh, all the developer were working together with the Turbine OEM developer to get as much as they can install in 2020, because next year is the deadline. So we will, we at the GWAC, we will maintain our forecast for China for 2020. That's a 3.5 gigawatt. Um, so last year we have nearly 2.4 gigawatts. So uh, if they will, the situation will remain the same, nothing change or stretch back of the coronavirus, uh, we believe that China will maintain at the largest offshore market. Thank you. Thanks, Feng. And just to wrap it up, I'll, I'm going to throw one more question your way. Um, we have some question, a few questions here about how how technology innovation um, will further drive offshore wind growth. Um, so this is new uh, blade designs. Alistair already touched a bit on floating, um, but then also looking into um, other uh, kind of potential opportunities for offshore wind, such as um, offshore wind to, to green hydrogen. So Huang, if you want to just give a, a bit of a update on that, um, that'd be great. Yeah, I think in terms of innovation, uh, without innovation or uh, technology breakthrough, there's no way to see how, for example, the UK market can get the price down looking at the um, option price from the CFD if we compare the latest price, the lowest one uh, released uh, in 2019, um, which is 65% lower than the first auction price back in February 2015. So to print on the cost, technology innovation absolutely is one thing. The larger uh, lane plate turbine myself means less foundation, less tower, less cables. And also uh, blades, that's uh, also another way because the blades are getting uh, longer, uh, bigger. So more carbon fiber uh, need to be adopted. And also in the same time, um, since we are going to have a lot of off your wind to be built um, in the pipeline, uh, the leading turbine OEM start thinking about the, you know, the, re the recycle of the, the material. And also we have uh, this in Denmark uh, launched their carbon neutral uh, footprint in terms of the supply chain. I think that's a good indication about uh, you know how the industry will continue to bring uh, the new installation in the same time thinking about the uh, innovation material wise, turbine drive turn wise. Um, so uh, I mean floating foundation right now uh, it's not a mainstream uh, looking at our data, uh, last year we only have two floating turbines installed um, together 11.3 megawatt globally. But there is a, one slide um, mentioned uh, in Alastair's uh, slide. We will see a lot of uh, increase in terms of um, floating. I think it's a matter of the economic scale. Uh, we have the demonstration project in the pipeline. Uh, mainly in the in France and also in the UK, uh, Portuguese and also soon in Japan, we have Ikrino are going to build the project uh, 88 megawatt uh, in the pipeline. So the more we build, the, the more we learn. And that's how we, we, we can figure out uh, which foundation design floating wise, that's the best uh, uh, solution in terms of the cost reduction. So uh, again, uh, we will continue to see uh, the the involve uh, the, the involving of the technology innovation uh, offshore wise is not just the, the turbine uh, itself because offshore we have more uh, section need to be taken into account in terms of cost reduction we have the balance of plan from a foundation uh, vessels and cables etc I think uh, we will see uh, more um, excellent um, solution to be uh, released, not just in Europe. I think from what I know, uh, the, the Chinese uh, turbine OEM utility, they are looking at the, this direction as well. 
uh, as the one I mentioned, um, start from 2021, we're not going to have the, you know, government support in terms of the subsidiary. Um, so therefore, the Chinese market is looking at uh, seriously in terms of a new technology. Uh, we are planning to do one edition uh, of the offshore summit with the local partner this year. This depends regarding the timeline. We don't know. Uh, this depends on how. Uh, the situation will be in terms of virus um, in the global uh, setting. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fong. And I'll wrap up our webinar there. Um, if we didn't answer your questions uh, during the Q&A session, we'll, we'll follow up via email. So your questions will be answered, no worries. And um, just a reminder that next week on the 25th of March, we'll be releasing the full Global Wind Report, which will highlight all this data and um, also pro provide further insights into key markets to watch, um, technology trends, as well as wider insights into the global wind industry. So stay tuned next week for that report. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the webinar, you'll receive a recording um, of today's webinar via email. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to send me an email and uh, I'll help you out the best I can. Um, have a great afternoon, everyone, and, uh, and stay safe.